Thank you much, everybody. Thanks for coming. And thank you very much for inviting me. I feel quite honored to be here. As you heard, I'm, I'm a Jesuit brother. And that means I'm a member of a Roman Catholic religious order. And the theology you'll be hearing tonight is Roman Catholic theology. That's what I know. It'll be interesting for those of you who are not Roman Catholics, I suspect there's one or two of you in the audience here, <laughs> to compare my take on these issues with your take on these issues. Because it's through these comparisons that we learn. Besides being a Roman Catholic Jesuit brother, I'm also a scientist. I've got degrees, you know, if you heard all about them, active in my field, zillions of publications, blah, 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 blah. With a background like that, both as a Jesuit and as a scientist, it's probably no surprise to hear me say, yeah, I have no problem with faith and science. I do it all the time. I live it all the time. My, my collar and my MIT ring prove that it is possible to be, at the same time, a fanatic and a nerd. <laughs> Where I get into trouble is when people think that my religious status as a scientist means that I can say that as a scientist, I endorse religion, you know, as if God is thrilled that finally an MIT graduate believes in him. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Some people think that I'll be able to use science to prove my faith. But that really is a false hope. Science changes. God doesn't. Any God that's proved by science, as if science proved things, would be a poor imitation of the real God. Any religion based on science would be subservient to that science and prone to be thrown away when that science is superseded by the next version of science. A supernatural God must be bigger than any natural logical system. That's what supernatural means. The supernatural is by definition above, outside of, bigger than the natural. So trying to pin down to limit or to prove or disprove the supernatural in terms of the natural is a pointless exercise. But that's not to say that my science and religion don't talk to each other. Not to say they don't have interesting things to say to each other. They must. There's only the one me who's both the fanatic and the nerd. There's only the one me who believes in God and does the science. I believe in God, I believe in science. The question isn't why do I believe in God, but why do I believe in science? Indeed, looking for a rational proof is deceptive because it forgets how rationality exa itself ex you know, functions. Gödel's theorem tells you that every logical proof, every logical system has to start with axioms with principles that you believe before you can start building logic. You learned that in Euclid's geometry, where you've got the 18 axioms. 17 of them make sense. The 18th is really weird, but if you assume it, then you can make the rest of Euclidean geometry work. And the higher mathematicians will point out that if you don't accept that one, you get some really interesting geometries, unlike boring old Euclid. The point is, if you change your axioms, you can prove anything you want. In practice, it's the anything you want that comes first. And that determines the axioms that you decide to adopt. In essence, it's not God that you're getting at the chain and you're through the chain of your reason at the end of the chain. It's God you're starting with at the beginning. Belief comes before the explanations. And here's the thing. My belief in God is one of those axioms that makes my belief in science possible. My life of faith is essential to my life of science. My science depends on God. Even more than that, I'm going to insist that everybody's science depends on God, even those scientists who claim they don't believe in God. In fact, I can come up with three axioms that you must accept on faith before you can do any kind of meaningful science. And these are axioms that depend on your religion, because not all religions accept these. First of all, you have to believe in reality. The universe exists. It's not just a dream. 
Secondly, if you're going to go off looking for the laws of nature, you've got to believe ahead of time that there are laws there to be found. And third, you have to believe that it's worth your time to spend the time and fortune that it takes in pursuit of discovering those laws. Now, I maintain that all of these axioms are themselves religious. By that, I mean there are some religions that don't accept one or another of these axioms. These axioms are only supported by a small subset of religion. And your religion or your choice of religion may affect how you believe in these axioms. As a result, only certain religions are going to give you the necessary conditions for science to flourish. First, consider the, uh, the assumption of realism. There, there's a famous story of the Chinese Taoist, uh, Zheng Zhi. Once Zheng Zhi dreamt he was a butterfly, a butterfly flittering and fluttering around, happy with himself and doing as he pleased. He didn't know that he was Zheng Zhi. Suddenly, he woke up, and there he was, solidly and unmistakably Zheng Zhi. But he didn't know if he was Zheng Zhi who had dreamt he was a butterfly, or a butterfly dreaming he was Zheng Zhi. And of course, he's got a point. Maybe everything is an illusion. The idea of the existence of a physical reality is something we have to assume, knowing full well that our ability to perceive that reality is strongly limited by the limits of our senses. But you know, even the quantum physicists, who are the weirdest of the physicists, even they have to accept the physical manifestation of their experiments in the macroscopic world that that must be real, even if they ponder the underlying nature of the reality that, that makes the needles move. Otherwise, if you don't believe that, you got nothing to study. Or at least what you're studying isn't physics anymore, but metaphysics. You know, if you don't appreciate how important this concept, this assumption is, just consider the fix that neuroscience finds itself. You can see from the cartoon, I don't understand how my brain works, but my brain is what I rely on to figure out how things work. Is that a problem? Mm, not sure how to tell. Second, you have to believe that nature follows physical regular laws. You have to believe in the existence of these laws before you can even consider going to look for them. And again, not every religion works that way. OK, this is a, 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 an ancient Greece from about 550 BC. It's you know, depicting the gods of ancient Greece. It illustrates a scene from the legend that made, was made famous 100 years later in the play Prometheus Bound by Aeschylus. To quote the scene, the earth-born dweller of the Cilician Caves, impetuous Typhon, withstood all the gods, hissing out terror with horrid jaws, while from his eyes lightened a hideous glare, as though he would storm by force the sovereignty of Zeus. But the unsleeping bolt of Zeus came upon him. So there's Zeus with the lightning bolts over on that side, and there's Typhon the monster who lives in the caves underneath the mountains of Cilicia. And uh, where's Cilicia? Cilicia is an ancient kingdom in present-day Turkey. It's located between the Carpathian Mountains and the sea. Notice what you find in those mountains. This is Google Maps map of active volcanoes in Turkey. Think of volcanoes. Listen again to the description of the monster. Hissing out terror with horrid jaws, while from his eyes lightened a hideous glare, as though he would by force storm the sovereignty of Zeus. Fire and smoke rising into the sky, challenging the realm of Zeus. And what happens when you see volcanoes erupt? You see lightning bolts. This photograph was taken over that famous volcano in Iceland with the unpronounceable name that erupted in 2010. <laughs> to us, lightning follows Maxwell's equations and Ampere's law. A flow of electricity is pr promoted by the presence of dust in the atmosphere. To the ancients, it was a battle between Typhon, the monster under the mountain, and Zeus, the god in the air who threw the lightning bolts. Now, if you think that volcanoes erupt because there's a monster under the mountain, 
and that lightning strikes the monster because there's a god in the air throwing the bolts, you've already got an explanation for what's going on in this picture. You don't need science. Things happen because the nature gods make it happen. If you deny the existence of nature gods, then you've got to come up with another explanation for volcanoes and lightning. On the other hand, if you don't reject the nature gods, it would never occur to you to look for another explanation. The one religion allows for science, the other religion has no room for it. There's a third axiom, but before I get on to that, I want to stop right here and reflect on something else about what these pictures mean. Not about science, but about God. Because I've insisted I cannot prove that I'm right in believing that there is a real universe and everything is an illusion. I can't prove that things in nature, like lightning and volcanoes, don't actually occur because there's some whimful gods. But if I do accept the hypothesis that there are no nature gods, that there are no dreaming butterflies, that I'm making a pretty interesting and strong statement about the kind of God that I do believe in that is compatible with my belief in science. First of all, I believe in a God who is real, as tangibly real as any butterfly or any volcano. But at the same time, I'm also insisting in a God that's part of this universe, but not part of this universe, supernatural. Only a supernatural God can give our life meaning. Only a supernatural God existent outside of the mechanism of nature's laws can, experience, can account for our experience of beauty, freedom, love, and therefore be worthy of our adoration. Uh, consider how the book of Ecclesiastes opens. We're familiar with it. It goes, vanity of vanities, all is vanities. The, uh, the retired British Lord Jonathan Sachs, chief rabbi in the United Kingdom, has a different translation of vanity of vanities, the way he phrases it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Man's fate is like that of the animals, the same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. This is not modern philosophy. This was around 2,500 years ago. The idea wasn't invented by modern science. It didn't come out of the Enlightenment. It didn't come out of the theory of evolution. It didn't come out of the Big Bang. It's been around since the book of Ecclesiastes was written. As Rabbi Sachs points out in his book, The Great Partnership, such a view is perfectly self-consistent and philosophically naive. The whole genius of the God of Abraham, he reminds us, is in the supernatural nature, what he calls the discovery of God beyond the universe. The gods of paganism were within the universe. Maybe they were stronger than human beings. Maybe they lived longer than human beings. But they were still inside the universe. And though, therefore, they could not have created the universe. And because they're inside the meaning, they could not give meaning to the universe. To quote Wittgenstein, the sense of the world must lie outside the world. The chair that you're sitting in only has meaning because you're sitting in the chair. You outside of the chair gives a reason for the chair to exist. Consider how this supernatural God has a personality completely different from the nature gods of the Greeks and the Romans. Those gods, they could care less about us. The universe was made by accident. They're off doing other things and, oops, there's a universe. Oops, there's some people. Maybe we can have some fun with them. Our God gives us a universe that is deliberate, that was made by choice, that at every step along the moment of creation, this creator God says, this is good. And it's a really interesting, wonderful paradox because it's a universe that follows predictable, reliable laws and yet 
can still give you something as impossible to predict ahead of time as the path of a lightning bolt. It allows as part of its law unpredictability. Whether we're talking about quantum unpredictability or the unpredictability of chaotic motion or unpredictabilities we haven't even discovered yet. It's a universe of both law and surprise. Interesting kind of God. This raises another question. Where did science actually get started? We're talking about these things that you need for science. Where did science get, go, get going? Who was the first person to think there would be laws? Who was the first person who said, I'm going to spend some time looking for those laws? Who was the first person to find laws that we still think are true today? You could argue it was Aristotle, but it's kind of curious. After Aristotle, more than, more than a thousand years went and no further progress was made in physics. The Romans were great engineers. I live outside of Rome. I take the train into Rome every day. It goes past an aqueduct. The aqueduct is more than 2,000 years old. Actually, that's terrible engineering. They wasted all that money building an aqueduct that's not going to be used, right? <laughs> terrible over-engineering. They should have had, uh, you know, um, what's it, planned obsolescence. They, they hadn't invented that yet. <laughs> but the thing is, engineering is not the same as science. Being able to build things is not the same as having an idea in the abstract of how things work. The Romans made no progress at all in asking how the natural world worked, much less why it worked the way it did. The one name you can think of in Roman science that's remembered today, I'd say probably Ptolemy. But Ptolemy actually wasn't a Roman. He was a Greek working and living in Egypt. And what he was doing was trying to figure out ways to calculate the positions of planets so that he could cast better horoscopes. Astrology is kind of like the engineering of astronomy, I guess. Where did science come from? You can't expect a society to support a culture of science unless that society is big enough and rich enough to be able to afford it. It takes a village to do science. You need a community of people willing to waste their time asking these sorts of questions about rocks and leaves and the origin and motion. But you also need a space where it's safe to ask those questions a place where you can be free to admit you don't know the answers. Whether it's the pagan gods or the, the philosophy of physics that Aristotle had, if you think you know ahead of time how nature works, you're never going to look any further. The medieval universities, for the first time, had the magic combination. They were a place where scholars could gather, where the conversation that is science could take place. They were supported by a culture that was big enough and rich enough to let a, a small number of really smart monks like Albert the Great, Roger Bacon, where they could collect leaves and rocks and perform experiments and ask questions, look for patterns, and describe those patterns in terms of rules. As monks, they had the education and the free time to pursue their studies. And as Christians, they had a belief system that cleared away the easy answer of both the pagans and the ancient philosophers. Pierre Duhem, who wrote a history of science about 100 years ago, identified what he called a key moment in the history of science in 1277. Bishop Tempier of Paris, which was the home of the then new University of Paris, challenged the Aristotelian dominance in science by pointing out that Aristotelian physics couldn't be the final word, it appeared to have no room for God's power. For example, to insist, as Aristotle did, that there could not be other worlds, by which they meant parallel universes, was to deny God's power to make anything he wanted. Thomas Aquinas famously reconciled Aristotle to Christian theology, but the impetus to look beyond Aristotle's physics Inspired, inspired John Buridan in 1355 to write about the motions of bodies in a terms he called impetus. It was the forerunner of Newton's idea of momentum. 
Nicholas Arim in 1377 speculated about the relative motions of the Earth and the sky, which was in anticipation of Copernicus. Nicholas of Cusa in 1440 even proposed that every star is a world unto itself. Modern science was beginning to be born right then. And then the plague, the Black Death, killed a third of Europe. The population of Europe wouldn't recover until about 1600, which is when William Gilbert and Tycho Brahe and Galileo and Kepler could finally give birth to what we can finally recognize as science with careful observations of nature described in mathematical laws. Now remember, all of this happened in the context of the universities. And universities were the place funded by the church to train leaders of the church in philosophy and theology. But before you could study philosophy, you need to know how to read and write the trivial courses, the trivium. And then you needed a background with the tools of analysis that you get in mathematics, in, in arithmetic, in geometry, and music, and astronomy. Of course, our modern universities are much, much different. It's not as if our ultimate idea is to get a degree as a doctor of philosophy or that we would ever dress up in funny black robes and walk around a campus. <laughs> so, our religion allows us to assume the world is real and by rejecting the nature gods, it gives us room to look for other explanations for how nature works. But there's one final religious axiom that is essential to make science possible. Science only happens when you're convinced that science is worth doing. And that's not something you can take for granted. Just, you know, talk to congressional funding committees. <laughs> but it's more than just getting the money to do the science. I gave a talk a while back at College of Charleston, South Carolina. And one of the students came up to me after the talk and full of enthusiasm, and he goes, I want to be a geologist. And I thought, great, you know, I was an undergraduate geology. I do the geology of planets. Geology is full of great people. There's all sorts of fabulous stuff you can do. You choose the right corner of geology. You can work outdoors in some of the most beautiful locations on Earth. Sounds great, I said. Yeah, but he goes, but what do I tell my mom? <laughs> He's in South Carolina. He's in the Bible Belt. In the culture where he grew up, studying geology with our ideas of billion-year-old rock formations directly contradicted the way he'd been taught about the Bible. To be a geologist for him would be declaring war against his religion, his home, his family, his mom would be ashamed of him. Scientists are people. We have families. We have desires. Like every human being, we're a mixture of reason and heart. We have hearts that, with reasons that reason does not know. And like that student, we have to answer those desires inside us and the desires in the people who are close to us. Now, there's a temptation to divide our experience into separate categories. Emotion versus logic. Faith versus science. It's a false division. Real people are not just Kirk or just Spock. Heck, even Kirk and Spock were not just Kirk or just Spock. And we have to live with others who themselves are more than just Kirk or just Spock. It's on the basis of both reason and gut feeling that we make all the decisions in our life. In the case of the student from South Carolina, it meant choosing between his science and his religion. But to me, as someone who's, who's lived both with science and religion all my life, that kind of choice is utterly puzzling. What were his parents thinking of? Why would anyone think you had to make that choice? Oddly enough, it was Captain Kirk who helped me make sense of that dilemma. How it happened that I wound up talking to William Shatner is a long story. I won't go into it. But I was talking to him, and I described myself as a Jesuit scientist, and he was flabbergasted. I could remember him saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, he goes. And as we talked, it suddenly became clear to me something that was so obvious to him that I had never grasped before. He saw 
religion and science as two competing sets of truths, two big books of facts. And what happens if the facts in one book contradict the facts in the other book? But science is not a big book of facts. You know, the orbits of the planets are facts, right? And, 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 and you can describe the orbits of the planets perfectly if you use Ptolemy's uh, epicycles and you have an infinite number of circles within circles within circles. It's called Fourier's theorem. It will perfectly describe the motion of the planets. You can also describe the motion of the planets pretty darn well using Kepler's ellipses. The difference is that only one of them, Kepler, leads to Newton's insight about the nature of gravity. Science isn't the facts of the orbit. Science is what you do with the facts. Science is also being open to the realization that even Newton's laws are not the last word. Not even Einstein's general relativity, the modern replacement for Newton, is the last word. You know, the science of 3016 is going to look a whole lot different from the science of 2016, I hope. And likewise, our faith is not based on rigid certainties. Um, William Shatner said, well, but, but what about blind faith? I tried to remind him something that Anne Lamott said. I don't always agree with Anne Lamott, but I love this phrase of hers. She goes, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. Think about that. If you're sure, you don't need faith. It's when you're not sure, when you can't be sure, that you have to say, OK, I'm going to go ahead anyway. I have faith that this is the direction to go. That's completely the opposite of the meaning that he was looking for. He'd heard this word blind faith, and he thought that meant accepting something as certain without looking, closing your eyes to the reality around you. That's not faith. To the contrary, remember what Moses says to his people after he's given them the tablets of the law. Do not forget the things your eyes have seen, or let them fade from your heart. As long as you live, teach them to your children and to their children after them. It's not close your eyes and believe everything I tell you. It's teach what you have seen. Blind faith is not walking around with blindfolds, blinding yourself to the truth. It's proceeding after you've done everything you can to see and you still can't see everything. Because even when we're blind, when we can't see, when we don't have the knowledge of the truth, we still have to step forward and proceed. If we knew the answer, we wouldn't need faith. And so faith is how we deal with the fact that we have to proceed anyway, that we don't know. It's with faith that we make choices about where we're going to go to school, what career we're going to pursue, where we're going to live, who we're going to marry. My student in Charleston would choose geology or not choose geology as an act of faith, not because he found the answer by looking in the Bible, but precisely because he couldn't find that answer there and he had to follow the tugs of both his head and his heart. All of life is making crucial decisions on the basis of inadequate information. It's a leap of faith to start a family. It's a leap of faith to join a religious community. It's a leap of faith to move to a new home, a new city, a new country. Uh-huh. This now works, we think. It's been working. So these decisions that change our lives are made not only on the basis of inadequate and often incorrect information, they're made by ignorant, stubborn, and inexperienced teenagers like that kid up there, <laughs> the one without the beard. That's me. At the very least, we hope we make these decisions with the help of some other people to advise us. We don't want to make them on their own. We don't want to make them without any input from a community of family and friends. And at least we want to show those kids who we once were some worked out examples to suggest if you make these choices, these are what the consequences might look like. 
The church does not say to you, no, no, don't do that. The church says to you, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> and so our faith is what we bring to the conversation we have with our elders, with our advisors, with our parents and our teachers concerning these very questions. We listen to their experience in making those decisions, and even more, the, experience, the experiences they had in those numinous moments when they, or the people they spoke with, experienced the numinous. It's, it's a rare moment that any of us experience God, and so it's important that we pool those experiences together to compare and to learn from the similarities and the differences, just as important is to sort out the real experiences from the spurious experiences. That's why we have communities that we call religion. That shouldn't be surprising. That's the same reason we put up with big science. That's why we have universities. I mean, there are rare examples like uh, Svinrasa Ramanujan, who was a remarkable self-taught mathematician from India. And he was able to reinvent calculus all on his own without having been taught it or seeing it in the book, um, frankly, most of us would rather have a textbook and take advantage of the work that's been done by people ahead of us. It's really useful to have a teacher. It saves a lot of time, if nothing else. But that means placing our faith in that professor, in this institution. Large institutions can do things that individuals can't. It comes at a cost, of course. Everybody hates bureaucracy, but try living without it. Bureaucracy makes sure that a certain minimal amount of work actually gets done regardless of who's in charge, regardless of who's called in sick. It's not always pretty, but it gets you there. I remind you, as the Vatican's planetary scientist, I work every day throughout my career with a bureaucracy that's huge, ungainly, often out of touch with the day-to-day the -day needs of the people it's supposed to be serving, at times, it seems to be run by total idiots. And yet, at the end of the day, NASA is the only outfit that can get me to the moon. <laughs> Some people think I'm talking about a different, I, I can't imagine. <laughs> Science, like faith, is done as part of a big community. And if you don't have the support of your community, it's not going to happen. It can't happen. And without a community, it couldn't possibly be passed on to the next generation. And that's why it makes a difference what your community, what your society thinks about the things you choose to want to do. There's a billion people in India. There's a heck of a lot of mountains and a lot of snow. When was the last time you ever noticed the Indian Olympic team in the Winter Olympics? You didn't. How come? Sports of that kind at any level just are not part of the culture. If the society you live in doesn't think that doing downhill skiing is important, you're not going to find many people doing downhill skiing. Now, you're not going to find many moms who are proud that you won the downhill ski race. If the society you live in doesn't think doing science is the sort of thing that will make a mother proud, you're not going to find many kids studying science. And you won't find anybody who, you can who will teach it to you, and you won't find anybody who will want to learn what you can teach to them. And so there's another clue about the personality of this God who creates. We see that community is essential for doing science. It's also essential for finding and worshiping God. Who is this God who makes science and worship possible only in groups of other people. Someone who loves to get together. Someone who loves to get people together, to sing together, to dance together, to pray together, to explore together. A God of community. For me as a Catholic, I see this reflected in the Trinity, a community of three persons. While we're talking about India, Ancient India actually was far ahead of the rest of the world when it came to mathematics. What we call Arabic numerals actually were invented by the uh, Indians. But they never developed a study of the natural universe the way the medieval universities did. For their culture, 
The physical world was a place of test and trial. For the ancient Chinese, the highest achievement was to be a person of, of ethical behavior. For them, as for the Manichaeans in ancient Rome, the physical universe was a source of temptation. Chocolate. Chocolate is out there to make you feel guilty. It's out there to make you be so in love with your physical universe that you neglect. On the other hand, if you say that chocolate is a gift from God, and that eating chocolate is a way of giving praise to the creator, it's a completely different interpretation. <laughs> the people of the book, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims, we also have a belief that this physical universe was created by our God who looked at it every stage, said it was good. God reveals himself in the things he has created. That's not me, that's St. Paul. And I believe, as a Catholic, that God so loved the world, not good people, not ethical behavior, but the world so much that he sent his son not to carry us out of this world, but to redeem the world. I mean, read carefully what Jesus says about what happens after death. He promises not a, a paradise in the by and by, but eternal life. The resurrection was into a body more than ours, but containing all that ours contains, including the scars, including the appreciation of a good fish dinner. As St. Athanasius says in his book on the creation about 300 AD, by the resurrection, this physical universe has been cleansed and quickened and made sacred. And thus, if the universe is sacred, studying the physical universe is an act of worship. It's an essential part of being able to do theology or philosophy. The historian of science, uh, Stanley Yaki, has argued that this is the crucial difference between the West and the East. The reason why science was born in Padua and Paris, Cambridge and Berlin, and not in Bihar or Beijing. Ironically, that's the Christianity that fundamentalists lose. But, but it's also something that affects the choice of an individual. Why does any particular person choose to become a scientist? What goodies does being a scientist get you? Being a scientist lets you do what? What is it we're trying to do when we do science? What constitutes success in science? Back when I was in the Peace Corps, I uh, trained with a bunch of about 80 teachers, most of them right out of college, full of idealism. And during the breaks between training, we'd go out and, and play this game called Hacky Sack. The idea is that somebody tosses this beanbag in the air, everybody takes turns kicking it up in the air, you kick it or you bop it with your head, you do use anything but your hands and arms. It's kind of like soccer, and that's it. It's that kind of cooperative, feel-good kind of activity you'd expect from a bunch of do-gooder peace car types. <laughs> so, we're stateside during training. The boyfriend of one of our group comes by to visit. He's watching us play hacky sack. He's from New York City. And this New Yorker couldn't figure out what the heck we were doing. He goes, what, you, you just kick it up in the air? No goals? No contact? No trying to stop the other guy from getting it? How do you win this game? <laughs> well, science is like hacky sack. It's a cooperative activity. You gain status by how much you give, what you can add to the field, how much your work helps the others in the field. You try to keep lots of ideas up in the air to keep them alive and pass them on to the next player. There's never a moment when you say, I won, you lost. So, what drives you to do it? What is your personal goal? How do you win this game? What do you consider winning? Now, there are plenty of obvious criteria for what a university might consider signs of success. You know, the kind of things that give you tenure. The approval of others. Good letters of recommendation give you tenure. Tenure itself is a sign that you've won. Grant money, prizes, honors, awards, the MacArthur Fellowship, the Nobel Prize, and a lot of other prizes. Fame in general, getting your name in the New York Times, getting your name in uh, Sky and Telescope. Another sign of success 
is having successful students. It's kind of like parenthood. Sometimes you want to live through your offspring. And then, of course, there's that all-time favorite men, uh, metric of tenure committees, have you written papers that other people use? The more papers, the more citations, the more successful you are. Now, that all sounds very crass, the way I put it. Clearly, that's not the whole picture. There's another carrot out there, academic freedom. In other words, you're successful if you've reached a state where you can set the criteria for what you want to study. You're free to choose your own topics. You're not just working for someone else. You're not just an employee. You're not just a student. You're not just limited by what NASA or NIH will pay for. But you're in it, and you're in a position where maybe you can sit on the committees that tells NASA what you think is important. But notice what that means. You win at science by being able to do science. It's kind of circular. Why is it that we want to do science? What do we get out of doing science itself? Indeed, are any of these things ends in themselves? Here's a table of contents of a, of a recent issue of Science, one of the top scientific journals in the world. Getting a paper in science is a big deal. It's a sign of success. So do you wake up in the morning and jump out of bed and rush to the lab because, by golly, today is going to be the day when you get to be one of the et al. authors that will tell the world something really new and exciting and groundbreaking about the effect of collective molecular reorientations and Brownian motions of colloids in nematic liquid crystals. It actually is important work. According to the, uh, the NASA uh, astrophysics data system, that paper has been cited since its publication 17 times. Is that what really motivates you? Is that what really gets you to go moment to moment? What are the personal motivations that might conceivably have to work in science? Curiosity, the pleasure of solving problems, the pleasure of, of finding patterns. That's what makes doing jigsaw puzzles fun. That's what makes doing crossword puzzles fun. And you know what happens after you've solved a book of crossword puzzles? You throw the book away. It's the fun of doing the puzzle. But science has got to be more than that. It's got to be more than just doing puzzles. One obvious central pillar of doing science is the search for truth. At the end of the day, there's more to truth than just getting the right answer to the puzzle. And here, for the first time, maybe you can get a glimpse of what I mean when I say that there is God at the center of all science. That is, if you worship the God who is the way, the truth, the life. And, and, and how about love? If we didn't experience love in this work, we wouldn't do it. And God is love. But wait a minute. How do these criteria stack up against the first set? Now, which candidate would you choose if you were on a committee? Would you choose the faculty member who really loves the material or the one who publishes the most papers? What do you think most committees are going to choose? How could you argue with them? In real life, it's never such a clean choice. Would you sacrifice anything on list one in order to obtain anything on list two? Would you sacrifice anything on list two to get what you wanted on list one? Would you? Hmm. Would you give up the approval of others to satisfy your own curiosity, or vice versa? Would you give up tenure to satisfy love, or vice versa? Would you give up academic freedom, the freedom to pursue your own research, to satisfy the pleasure in solving problems, or vice versa? In other words, yeah, I can do anything I want, but nobody's paying for it. And on the other hand, if I go into the sandbox that you're providing for me, I get to play in that sandbox and have a great time, but I have to do the problems you're paying me for. Which do you choose? Do you give up fame to satisfy the pleasure in finding patterns, or vice versa? Do you give up grant money to satisfy truth, or vice versa? Where is your heart? Where is your God, and what does that say about the personality of the God you worship. Before you, you jump to one conclusion or another, remember that 
If you're not getting paid to do the work, and I assume you're not independently wealthy, then you can't do the work. You can't afford to feed yourself. You can't do any work at all. And if you aren't doing work that the culture respects and supports, then you're not going to have very other many, many other people to share the work with. And science is this conversation with other people. So if you're not doing work that the society supports, you're not going to be able to do the work. Internal satisfaction isn't enough. Something else is the ultimate criterion. Is it truth? Well, if you lose sight of that criterion, the work is meaningless, poorly done. On the other hand, without those internal motivations, without some sort of internal payout, there's no, I mean, I'm not going to get up tomorrow morning to say, I'm going to find truth today. I've got to have something much more immediate, something much more powerful driving me. We say it's for truth. But I say there's something else going on. I say we don't do the science for truth, for money, and we wanted to be a scientist, there's a lot of other ways to make money. For power, there's no science in being power, you know, there's no power in being a scientist. Uh, you, you don't do science to get girls, at least it didn't work for me. <laughs> we do the science for joy. What's joy? Let me show you. That's joy. That's joy. That's joy. That is joy. That's joy. The fact that God has created the universe is fascinating in and of itself. The fact that the universe is rational and reasonable and able to be understood by the creatures he created tells you something deeper about God's personality. These images are joyful. What I can't do justice to here is that learning about the science itself is even more joyful. I remember a few years ago, I had a sabbatical year, so would most people take their sabbatical year to do research. I took my sabbatical year to teach. I wound up teaching at Fordham. I had a class of really bright students. They were taking the introduction to electricity and magnetism. So we learned Maxwell's equations. And I'm writing Maxwell's equations on the board in front of the class, doing all the mathematical manipulations that Maxwell had done back in 1865. And it shows how electricity gives rise to magnetism, how magnetic fields can give rise to electric fields, but then if you take a derivative here and you put in a substitution there, and as I write down the final equation, the result of all this manipulation, which is a complicated scrawl of E's and T's and del's and mu sub zeros, before I had a chance to turn around and explain what it all meant, my brightest student in the class whispered under his breath but loud enough for everyone to hear him, looking at the equation that came out of manipulating Maxwell's equations, he looked at the equation and he went, oh my God, it's a wave. And those of you who are physicists know exactly what I mean. Every bit of science we can extract from these glorious pictures starts with Maxwell's equations. It starts with the fact that, oh my God, it's a wave. The fact that it's a wave is what gives us radio, electric power transmission, alternating current, special relativity, general relativity. Now, it takes a couple of semesters to get from Maxwell's equations to all those other things. But when you get there, take my word for it. Take my student's word for it. It is an oh my god moment. In my research, 40 years of research, I've had a handful of those moments. Nothing as big as Maxwell, of course. A couple of moments, big enough one to publish in Nature, one to publish in Science. But it's not the final paper that I remember. It's the gasp of, of amazement that I had when suddenly I saw a pattern in Nature that I had not anticipated. Where's God in Science? 
Well, science is about the universe, everything, and God is everywhere. Science is about truth. As people of the book, we say that we believe in a God who is the way, the truth, the life. But most immediately, science is about satisfaction and joy. Indeed, the spirituality of St. Ignatius, the, the founder of my order, the Jesuits, talks about God as the source of consolation without cause, joy that surprises. Now, this is not some kind of pantheism. When Isaac Newton was trying to understand gravity and how gravity could do action at a distance, he noticed that gravity was everywhere and God was everywhere. Therefore, he toyed with the idea that maybe gravity is God. Um, he rejected the idea, rightly so. It's, it's a classic case of the, the, the fallacy of the undistributed middle. You know, the sun is yellow, bananas are yellow, therefore the sun must be a banana. <laughs> of course, if God actually was gravity, that would explain why Catholics celebrate mass. <laughs> no. What I'm saying is that uh, the, the meta reasons underlying science are exactly the pointers that point to God. The very thing that makes science worth doing and desirable to do are the places where we see God, the places where we get a clue to what God is. So let me end with one last story. This is the bridge going to MIT. I'd walk across this bridge every day when I was a postdoc. By the time I turned 30, I'd be walking across this bridge and I'd be wondering, why am I going to work? And I'd lay in bed at night, three at the morning, and have those three at the morning questions. Why am I wasting my time doing astronomy when people are starving in the world? Isn't this an almighty waste of my time and my effort and my life? And I could not come up with an answer. So I quit. I quit my position at MIT. I joined the Peace Corps. I told them, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you ask me to do. So they asked me to go to Kenya, and they asked me to teach in a high school, and live in a mud hut, and teach in a classroom where there was no window in the windows and no black in the blackboards. And I said, yeah, yeah, send me in, coach. And as soon as I finished training, uh, and they discovered that I had a doctorate, they said, well, instead of being in a rural school, and, and we'll go to a government school. And then, and then they moved me to a national school. And then they moved me to one of the best high schools in the country. And then three years, three months after I started teaching at this high school, I was moved again to the University of Nairobi, where I taught graduate students in the physics department astronomy. <laughs> now, there was a logic behind what they were asking me to do. The guys I was teaching all had jobs waiting for them at the Kenya Science Teachers College. I was teaching the guys who would be teaching the teachers who would be teaching in the schools. And you know, so learning a little bit of astronomy is a great way to learn physics. It made sense. That's not why they wanted to learn astronomy. Every weekend, in fact, I'd go up country, out of Nairobi. I was a whole lot skinnier back then. And I'd visit my friends in the Peace Corps who were still living in the mud huts where the schools had no windows in the windows and no black on the blackboards. And I'd set up my little telescope. And everywhere I went, the people in the village would come out and look at the telescope. And they'd look at the craters in the moon and go, wow. And they'd look at the rings of Saturn. And they'd go, wow. Anybody in this room ever see the rings of Saturn through a telescope? OK, of you, have any of you seen the rings of Saturn through a telescope and said, eh, who cares? No. You go, wow. They went, wow. My friends back in Michigan would go, wow. That's what human beings do when you see Saturn in a telescope. Now, I had a very clever cat in those days, but my cat never wanted to look through the telescope. <laughs> it's what people do. Telescopes are for humans. Looking at the stars, going, ah. Wondering about what are those stars? Who are we? How does it all fit together? That's one of those things that make us human beings and not just clever cats, well-fed cows. And to deny somebody that because they were born in the wrong continent or the wrong gender or the wrong whatever is to deny them their humanity. 
but to provide that to people reminds them and enriches them and makes them more human because it's not only your bodies that have to be fed, your souls have to be fed as well. You don't live by bread alone. I read that someplace. <laughs> to make this available to people is to remind them that we are the species that went to the moon. The whole human race, not just the astronauts, but the engineers who built the spaceship and the people who trained the engineers and the people who worked in the cafeteria where they learned and the people who grew the food. It was all of us as a human race who touched the moon. It's human to look at the stars and realize there is more to life than what's for lunch. The very thing that makes us different from a cow or a cat the very aspect that makes us breathe, oh my God, is what we call the human soul. That's what the theologians say is the image and likeness of God. Science needs that. Science needs, oh my God. If you don't have those moments, you don't do the science. Science needs the sense of awe. And that tells me the one last and most important trait of God a God who is awesome. Thank you very much.